What's up, sons? It's Blind Red with Son of Attack once again, and joining me today is Shai Verbowski, and he's going to be uh, discussing with us Caspa. And if you haven't heard of Caspa yet, Caspa is a new Layer 1 blockchain that has essentially uh, one of, if not the fastest transactions per second currently available, and a lot of that is due to the research and work that Shai here has done on something called ghost tag so we're going to be uh just kind of picking his brain and hopefully learning a little bit today about not only caspa but ghost tag and hopefully uh a little bit of cryptocurrency as a whole so welcome to the show shy and thanks for stopping in today sure thanks for having me so uh give me a little bit of background what other projects have you worked on in the past if any um, and then what got you interested in, into cryptocurrency? Uh, actually, this is my uh, first, this is my first uh, project in the cryptocurrency space. I have uh, other uh, cryptography projects, uh, which are part of my PhD, which I'm uh, hoping to complete this year in quantum cryptography. Uh, some of it is somehow related to blockchain, but I haven't been a part of any other project is in like a coin or a tech okay so how did you end up finding uh caspa then uh well i when i in my second year of my phd uh, i i was assigned to to the bta for a class in uh, introduction to algorithms and the other ta was yoni okay and that's how things started rolling. That's uh, how I knew the guy. I didn't know him before, and we got to talk a lot, and he got me really excited. And I was at a point where I, I could say I, uh, I lost hope a bit on the crypto. I've been following uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and all the things that were existed in uh, 2013, 2014, and it seems like... Uh, there are a lot of problems and not many or any solutions in the horizon. So uh, when uh, when uh, Jonathan told me he's going to start a new project, I was like, okay, good luck with that. And uh, I didn't have much faith in this either. And then uh, we talked about it a lot and he convinced me to, to educate myself, to, to read a lot about. I remember I had this moment of clarity when I read about this protocol. And I told to myself, hey, this works. This could actually solve all the scaling issues. And uh, that's what convinced me to come aboard. Okay. You dropped out a little bit, I think, there um, right before that, uh, I believe, before the portion about reading about the new protocol. I assume the new protocol you're referring to is Ghost Dag. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. So what were some of the biggest, like, uh, I guess you talk about losing a little bit of hope and faith in cryptocurrency. What was the biggest glaring issue to you as far as like, let's say, uh, from the perspective uh, of Bitcoin? Um, what was it that turned you off about that or what made you lose hope in it? Well, it doesn't scale. Um, I don't want to, to trash Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an amazing project and a, an amazing discovery. But uh, it seems that um, the narrative that excited me about Bitcoin when it just started was this entire idea of this completely self-sufficient and uh, self-contained payment system which doesn't rely on uh, anything external. And I was very excited. I remember specifically what, uh, what really disappointed me was this... Uh, when Steam started to accept Bitcoin as a payment method and the network just couldn't uh, handle the loads. And it seems like this vision, this original Satoshi vision of um, global payment system, which is completely decentralized, doesn't, uh, doesn't come to fruition. And I also had some reservation about how the the Bitcoin uh, developer community um, seems to be very, um, to push back against a lot of ideas which I thought are essential uh, in, because the, their philosophy is that hard forks should be avoided almost at all costs, which uh, is legitimate, but I disagree with and I think it 
it put a really huge um, like block on the potential of Bitcoin to evolve. And since then I've been following and looking for what will make Bitcoin scale. And it seems that most solutions don't really prove themselves. For example, Lightning Network. Lightning Network is an amazing protocol. It's, it's an extremely cool settlement protocol, but when you try to, to chain it and to route it and uh, all of this promise of using uh, lightning channels to get like this uh, world encompassing immediate uh, network, it just doesn't work. And I just, I didn't see on the horizon anything which would make Bitcoin useful as a payment system. And it kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I wasn't very invested in this world to begin with. I thought it was cool. And at some point, just my interest kind of waned. There wasn't like this moment of crisis when I said, oh, damn this all, I'm just going to do something else. <laughs> just like, because things, things really felt like they were stuck in place. Uh, my interest just kind of degraded. I understand. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And then I was going to follow up and ask you your thoughts on Lightning Network, but it seems you covered that and beat me to it. So uh, one of the kind of, I, I suppose, surrounding Bitcoin development in general, the, the kind of the argument I've heard in the past is kind of, or, or the way I've I kind of lost you mid-sentence. Oh, you lost me. Okay, hold on. We're having some connection issues still, I suppose. But um, I lost you a little bit there too. All right. I think we're good. Yes. All right, cool. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll create an analogy here, I guess, as far as uh, in comparison to Bitcoin, because part of the argument is that uh, it would be you want you want the changes to be slow and and sure. Right. So kind of like cooking a brisket or smoking a brisket, you want it slow and low, you know, do it, take your time with it and kind of make sure that nothing breaks in the process and then hopefully at the end everything will be good do you think there's any validity to you know having that you know that process of changes to bitcoin being slow like that part of the reason like you mentioned that they maybe do want to stay away from like hard forks and so on well i guess that uh, waiting eight hours for a brisket is fine waiting 12 hours for a brisket is fine some people even wait 24 hours for a brisket. I wouldn't wait 12 years for a brisket. And you're saying, you know, as far as for uh, Bitcoin, it's going to be extremely long for any significant changes to take place? It seems so. Uh, it seems that uh, it has been very long. In the, in the last years, we, we haven't seen much progress. In the specifically in the Bitcoin sector, right? Like the most exciting thing that has happened is the Taproot update, which is very nice, but uh, it's not the major advancement we've been uh, promised over the years. So then let's talk about Caspa and what it solves in, in Ghost Tag. So uh, from your perspective, Ghost Tag will solve the uh, specifically the scalability issues. Uh, that is presented with blockchain? Yeah, I think this is not the major uh, thing here. Okay. I mean, CASPA allows you to scale up the, the transaction throughput. You, you have very high TPS in CASPA, mm -hmm. but you have high TPS in other texts too. Scaling the TPS um, at all costs, there are ways to do it. Uh, with a lot of trade-offs that other techs do. I think what makes Casper exciting um, from the tech point is two things. One, that we didn't trade off much to, to get this TPS. We didn't uh, like shard our system into a million independent shards or uh, rely too much on, uh, on conjectural uh, security properties. You're referring um, and, to something like Ethereum uh, in the way they function to get there, right? Uh, I don't want to name anything, but I wasn't referring to Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum's uh, chain uh, has... Uh, well, I'm talking about Ethereum before the mill, because right. uh, I think POS, the proof of stake is not even a part of the discussion right now. In the proof of work world, um, 
Ethereum is a traditional chain with traditional times. Mm -hmm. There are other projects which manage to, to still have this uh, slow Ethereum-like confirmation times, but uh, do all sorts of tricks which introduce their own problems to increase the transaction throughput. And I think what's cool about Caspa is first that it manages to increase the transaction throughput without um, using solutions which has a uh, considerable drawbacks like sharding. And the second thing is that it manages to scale down confirmation times, which this is like the real key point here because no other tech, no other proof of work tech that I know of can do this. This is what makes Casper fast, mm -hmm. the time it takes to transfer money around. The fact that we can also do a huge volume of, uh, of transactions is just a bonus. Right. So let's touch on this really quickly. Let's touch on proof of work versus proof of stake. And why, uh, what do you think the, I know may, earlier you mentioned, you know, proof of stake is not even in the discussion. Why do you see proof of stake is not even being in the discussion at this point in time? Well, uh, I'm going to say something about proof of stake and I don't want it to sound disparaging. I'm not trying to, to bash proof of, proof of stake here. Um, but I don't think proof of stake could be really decentralized. Now, that's not to say that it's not valuable. There are uh, a lot of cool things you can do and the blockchain structure is very natural for a lot, a lot of cool applications. Um, but I don't think the goal of any proof of stake project, every, any interest in proof of stake project uh, at least, is to be uh, decentralized. And I think the dynamic, uh, which is naturally imposed by staking, doesn't allow decentralization. Because think about it this way. In Bitcoin, say you have 80% of Bitcoin, then you would still have to put in as much effort as someone who has zero Bitcoin if you want to take over the chain. And in proof of stake, uh, typically, if you have 60% of the coin, then you control the coin. And you have this rich get richer dynamic because um, you can't stake everything, only the reserves get stacked. So pocket money doesn't get staked and it, it causes this situation where the high, larger your reserve, the more you get from staking and, and then you get more control. So I don't think this, uh, this is like a death nail on proof of stake. There are a lot of interesting and cool things you can do with proof of stake, but I don't think any tech could, uh, proof of stake tech can claim that it is uh, decentralized. I was hoping that maybe Ethereum found the way. I thought um, that being a proof of work for like a decade so that you could spread your coin around and then transforming into proof of work could maybe prove itself as uh, something uh, which is both proof of stake and decentralized. But uh, also there we see a lot of problems. Like we see MEV attacks, we see collusions against uh, American sanctioned wallets. And this kind of stuff is, is uh, really a huge problem for decentralization. And I think at this point, only proof of work can really provide decentralization. So. Uh, That's why I'm putting proof of stake outside, not because I think it's inferior, but just because I think it's a completely different niche with a completely different set of problems it solves. Do you not think that to a certain extent, especially once you get moving into ASICs, et cetera, that you end up with centraliz centralization of hash power problems, kind of like we've seen with uh, Bitcoin between China? Uh, I'm and sorry, and uh, you got cut off again, but uh, I think I can complete the... Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. So, yeah, I was just asking, like, do you not see that as being a potential <coughs> issue with ASICs and the centralization of hash power as well? Yeah, I think it is an issue. Um, you can't uh, ignore this issue. But uh, uh, mining tends to get uh, centralized. And once mining uh, is centralized, then uh, you have problems of this kind, even in proof of work. And this is why I think high block rates are very, very important. And to some extent also um, high transaction rates because essentially what you want to do is to decrease the hardware entry barrier for it to 
for it to be like profitable for you to even mine. Like even if you have access to one Bitcoin ASIC, you wouldn't get anything from it, right? And why wouldn't you? Because if your fraction is, I don't know, like a millionth of the network, then the time you would wait for a block on average for some return on investment would be the block delay time a million. So it's like um, 10 million minutes in Bitcoin. If you have high block rates and you're the same fraction of the network, you don't have to be louder. Just because there are higher block rates, you would still gain the same fraction, but the time you would have to wait before you actually see money is very, very, um, shorter mm -hmm. and if you think about it in terms of transaction throughput uh, the problem one of the problems for entry barrier is not just how long you wait for a block because there are pools for that um, but another problem is how much coin you need to gain to accumulate even if you are in pools and you're getting shares how much do you need to accumulate before it becomes something that you can actually spend you go above the dust threshold and if you have more transaction, then the fee per transaction is smaller. And then again, you would have to wait a lot less time. So this high BPS and high ITPS combined make it that you need a lot less hardware, even if you're talking about ASICs, to be able to mine and expect to see some money within your lifetime, not to mention within a month. So I think... Yes, it is an issue that mining tends to be uh, centralized, but I also think that high BPS and high TPS would allow mining to remain much more uh, fractioned across the network. Yeah, and I think that's something that CASPA does do extremely well. It's one of the things that I try to drive home uh, when I'm talking to people about it is to build your own node for CASPA and to mine to that because uh, traditionally, you know, building your own node for something like Ethereum and even putting like a ton of hash rate on there, like say like 500 GPUs or something, it's still going to be astronomically long back in the day for you to actually find a block. And that problem appears to be solved with Casper to a certain extent to where I don't need near as much hash power to have the chance to find a block because there are so many blocks uh, per second, aka BPS, and uh, I think there's a there's a distinct advantage to be mining to your own node in Caspa, even at a smaller level uh, of hardware than there is on any other chain. So I think that's something uh, that Caspa does that's both unique and also uh, very exciting. So I agree with you there, um, and uh, I, I like the way you explained it for sure. Um, what is the purpose for the move from uh, Go language to Rust as far as a programming language goes and uh, what will be, of course, the benefits, et cetera, and, uh, and what is the timeline for that, right? <clears throat> yeah, okay. So um, maybe about uh, concrete timelines, I'm not exactly the person to ask. Uh, I'm going to give like a broad overview. Um, first, I would say that the motivation for redoing our code base in Rust is due to efficiency. Now, the key selling point of GhostDAG is that it removes the uh, security of the protocol as a bottleneck for how fast you can go. You can go as fast as hardware permits and still remain secure. So now we want to increase what is as fast as hardware permits. We want to make the hardware allow you to work hard, which may, to work very fast, which is just saying that we want our uh, implementation to be very efficient. So this means two things. One, we want to re-implement in a more uh, a performance oriented mindset and in a more performance oriented language. So like we carried a lot of uh, mistakes and a lot of decisions we made that uh, in retrospect we've done uh, differently because implementing GhostDAG is very, very difficult and we had to solve a lot of problems and implement a lot of things that were simply not implemented ever anywhere. And we have learned a lot. So rewriting everything first allows us to, allowed us to to apply this knowledge to do things 
uh, more cleverly this time and get uh, better performance. And also Rust is a very natural choice because it has this very efficient concurrency model, which works very nice with the DAG. I think one of the greatest benefits to performance comes from the fact that in a DAG you have several parallel blocks, so you can process them at the same time and use the fact that your machine, even if it's a cheap machine, all computers today have multi-cores, so you can put them all to work concurrently because you process blocks concurrently because this is the structure of your DAG. So I think the choice to rewrite was because we are now smarter and know how to do things better. And the choice to use Rust, it's, it's because it's very efficient exactly in the places where the, the code works the most, which is in concurrency and in the database access. Perfect. Uh, and then, of course, along with that, there is this proposal for a consensus protocol change called Dagnite. Um, and I know this is obviously this is a, an improvement proposal. It's not necessarily anything that would be uh, implemented uh, for sure. That being said, it would also come after the Rust upgrade, if I understand, uh, if at all. Could you give us a, a kind of an idea of uh, what your understanding of Dagnite is and do you think this has a good chance of passing? And if so, what kind of impact would it have on the protocol? Well, I'm going to say it bluntly. Dagnite is the perfect proof of work consensus protocol. Any property you would desire from a proof of work consensus protocol is either achieved by Dagnite or is known to be impossible. It's, I believe, the best possible. Um, protocol. And I'm going to tell you exactly on what it improves on Ghost Deck. And in general, when you design a system, you have to make assumptions about the network latency. And, and these assumptions affect how your system scales, how many blocks you're going to produce, and how long you would have to wait for confirmations. And if you overestimate the network latency, like you say it is a minute, but it is two seconds, then you are not optimal. You're operating much slower than you could operate. But on the other hand, if you underestimate it and you estimate it's like five seconds and in reality it's 10 seconds, then your security goes away. The security depends on your estimation being correct, like 95% of the time, you, you have a little leeway, but you need to account for deterioration of the network and all sorts of the rare, but not extremely rare events that could create bad uh, network conditions for a while. And this forces you to take a safety, safety margin. Uh, in Bitcoin, it's huge. Nobody think it's, it would take 10 minutes for a block to propagate but you still have to take this 10 minutes leeway because how the protocol works. And also in GhostDAG, you have to make this assumption. You can be a lot more, uh, a lot less uh, reserved, and you, but you still have to have this safety margin. And Dagnite is the first and only proof of work protocol, which is actually... Hello again. Hi, hi. So I think uh, where we left off last is you were about to say the first protocol, which is. Yes, it was a very off. dramatic point. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Dagnite is the first protocol to be reactive to changes in network latency. You wouldn't have to hardwire um, a bound on the network latency anywhere in the code. That's why we call it parameterless because it doesn't have a latency parameter. It just reacts to what happens in the network. So this has two consequences, which are huge. The first is that you don't have to have a safety margin anymore. You can just operate at the fastest speed possible. And if the network deteriorates for some reason, then Dagnite would respond to it and will remain secure. It would automatically slow down itself to the best possible under the um, deteriorated conditions. 
And it also means that in the future, as we get faster and better uh, internet connections and network, then it would also automatically scale down confirmation times um, to, to automatically respond to that. So we get essentially a proof of work that scales itself. Does that end up meaning that as a miner, you have an advantage with a better connection? No, no, it, not. I mean, in all techs, if you have a very poor connection, then you are in a disadvantage, right? right? You can't remove that element. But uh, the advantage of a well-connected miner uh, in Dagnite is, is completely identical to the advantage a well-connected miner has today in any other proof of work. It doesn't uh, give any additional uh, advantage. And I would even say that the inclusiveness of the protocol, the fact that you don't throw down, uh, throw away orphan blocks gives some advantage to slightly less connected miners. Like in Bitcoin uh, or in Ethereum, if you're slightly less connected and your block got orphaned, uh, it's a done deal, it's out. In Caspa, it could still be included in some conditions. Right. So does Dagnite as a consensus protocol include any changes to the algorithm? What do you mean? The mining algorithm? Correct. So. Like the hash? No. Uh, in no way whatsoever. Um, the, when we, you design a consensus algorithm, then you use the hash algorithm that you use. Uh, if it's a KVH or SHA or whatever, it's a black box. You just say, it's something that you put something on one side, you get something random on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then when you implement it, you can choose whatever you want. But when you implement Dagnet, there is no reason to, to switch to another uh, mining algo. And also the block templates would look the same. I don't want to guarantee it, but it's possible that even like the current mining software would still work because the block templates look the same. Okay. Would there ever be a situation in which the mining algorithm would change potentially? Well, Caspa is a community product and uh, every changes we make are decided by the community. So if someone will suggest that we change the mining algorithm to whatever and this the community would agree with it and it will be put to a vote and would get chosen as a, by a majority of the community, then yes, the, the algo could change. But uh, this much is true for any, like any project can just decide, okay, we are now changing the algo and we are not only going to support the code base of the new algo. Uh, so technically it's possible. I don't see any reason for this to happen though. Okay, and then another question, especially in relation to uh, KIP2, would be, uh, what is the governance model for this as far as CASP is concerned? What would, what, what determines whether or not uh, KIP2 would be uh, integrated into CASP or not? Well... Again, it's up to the community. At the end of the day, anyone can do anything. The CASPA current devs could do whatever they want with the code and anyone else can take a fork and do whatever they want. Essentially, the winning chain is the one which gets the most adoption. That's like generally in proof of work. You can make as many incompatible versions and, as you want, but the public decides which one they want to use and there's nothing you can do about it. So, I mean, it's by and large determined by which chain miners continue to mine on and transactions continue to be... Um... Yes, and these are two separate things. I mean, they are correlated. I can't say that they are uh, completely uh, mm -hmm. independent things, but they are separate things. Right? It could be a scenario where 80% of the miners go with one chain, but users say, no, no, we prefer the other chain. And you would see that the other chain gets all of the action and all of the um, transactions and all of the usage and all of the trading volume. 
even though it has less minors. And I reckon that in this situation, the minors would at some point give in and move to the more used chain. But it, right. there, it isn't a rule of nature that the chain with the most hash rate would be the chain which, with the most adoption. Typically, right. But adoption might, or hash rate might follow adoption as well. So, Or the other way around. Right. Uh, there is can, an intricate dynamic between the two. It could go either way, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so got that under lock. we kind of got an idea of what's going on with Dagnite. Um, there are some questions from the community and these are some questions that I've had. If you don't, uh, have the knowledge, uh, and you want me to wait to ask some other people, uh, that's fine. But there are clarifications for Dag labs and kind of the inception of the so the as as i understand it the formation of dag labs and the funding that was put into that for specifically the research uh, surrounding uh, some of the protocol right that ended up being utilized in caspa but obviously caspa still being a fair launch coin so um do you have any knowledge surrounding dag labs were you a part of that uh, at all yes i'm a former uh, dag labs employee Okay. And Perfect. I think all people which are, uh, we don't like the term core devs because we really believe that this is a community, pro community project and there isn't a core. I like to call us like the original contributors. But I think all people which are perceived as the uh, original contributors, and this includes uh, Jonathan and Michael and Ori and Elihai and Eyal and me. Uh, we are all former Daglobs employees. Okay. And um, I, I was never a part of management, so I wasn't part of the money talks, but I do know what happened. And it's not that much of a story. Essentially, um, um, Polychain and some other investors uh, decided to, to invest in the technology and the monetization model was to create uh, optical ASICs, like uh, designated hardware. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I don't think we plan to do it in-house, but to collaborate with the, with the other teams which worked on this kind of hardware. And the thing was to, to design this hardware and to uh, let the investor have some of this hardware as a um, return for their investment. Um, as we went along, uh, it became apparent that this uh, optical hardware isn't maturing as fast as we'd hoped it would. And at some point, uh, we, we ran out of uh, our uh, budget and we decided that uh, we don't want to pursue this path anymore. We don't want to raise any more funds, but we want to, to pivot to a community project. And some people uh, think it's uh, it's a bit weird um, that uh, that the investors would uh, allow this uh, like they, they put all this money into this and then they don't really have an advantage they're like they didn't get anything that everyone else didn't get for free um, but I, I don't think this is true I think for one the money was already put in so there is no reason to prefer no lunch over a fair lunch and they did have a uh, precedence. Like they, they, were, they were one of the first ones to know that this project is going to launch and to mine it. And now when we dissolved the uh, Dag Labs, a part of the agreement was that uh, uh, part of the money that remains uh, would be used by Dag Labs for mining um, in completely fair um, uh, terms like in fair competition mining and half of that would go to the investor and the other half would go to the um, to uh, contributors and uh, that's what happened I can tell you that I personally was the one that uh, ran this operation like all the mining done by Douglas it was essentially done by me I hired uh, all the um, servers and uh, um, maintained them and uh, I can tell you that we managed eventually to mine about 800 million Caspa, a little less than 800 million Caspa, which is about 3% of the uh, entire uh, 
circulation. Um, we actually thought we'd managed to mine a little more, but we were completely overwhelmed by how fast this coin took off. And, and, and that's about it. Um, and the investors got their share and that's just what happened. We, this is how we combined the fair lunch with, the, with getting some, uh, some investment, seed investments to, to kick us off. I mean, the investor is Polychain, right? That's pretty much the only investor. And that investor was investing into DAG Labs specifically, correct? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know that Polychain is the main investor. I don't know if it's the main investor or the only investor. I, I'm actually okay. not. I mean, okay. I can find it out later. And, uh, but it's not a uh, secret information or anything. It's just that I personally don't know. Yeah, it was hard to dig through. I was trying to dig through the FAQ and figure out like what lines drew to where. Um, but just to clarify, as far as um, what was done, there was investment money that was taken into DAG Labs that was utilized to mine CASPA in the beginning, correct? Yes, yes. Then, but uh, I do want to stress that it wasn't a pre-mine. It was a competitive mine. And um, we took all sorts of measures to make sure that the uh, mining is as competitive as possible from the get-go. Like we went, we were public and started to garner a community as soon as testnet launched, which is quite a few months before mainnet launch. We, we tried to advertise it to all crypto enthusiasts and a lot of people which were unrelated to Doug Labs or Polychain in any way. It came and looked around and a day before, we didn't decide on the mining algo until a day before the launch. Well, um, there was a community vote and the community decided to use KAV hash. We also introduced some modification to it. So uh, people with the, with the FPGAs for like currently, with, for variants which were at the time wouldn't have an unfair advantage from the start. And uh, we made mining as competitive and as fair as possible. And under these conditions, the money was put into mining um, the, the CASPA, which went to DAG Labs and to its investors. Right. Uh, and like, I'm not saying it's not a fair launch. I'm just clarifying so everybody understands. It's just very clear cut and dry. Some yeah, of that just, was utilized for mining CASPA in the want... beginning. And then that money or what, or that CASPA, not money, let me be very clear, that CAS, right, that was then distributed between the investors such as Polychain, and then a portion of it was uh, for the coders, devs, or contributors, i.e. you, mm -hmm. Yonatan, and everybody else on the DAG Labs Yes, team. It, was half in, it was split in half. Half for the investors, half for the contributors. Okay. Yeah, the point I, I wanted to stress is that we are not just fair lunch on paper. We didn't do the bare minimum so we could call ourselves a fair lunch. We went to great lengths to be as fair as possible, well beyond what you would technically need to honestly con call yourself a fair lunch. Yeah, no, nobody's nobody's attacking that. No, I'm not saying that you weren't. That, that I don't. Yeah, I know you aren't. I'm just. Uh, I'm not saying like uh, you're you're not a naysayer. I'm just saying I want people to to know just that being fair was very important to us, and we did everything we could. Just not not just um, what's enough. Okay, yeah, we're on the same page. Um, cool. So I think that that wraps up like as far as the tough questions go. Um, I'm going to look through here. I know I had, I'm going to refresh my page and see what other questions uh, people had in relation to CASPA and make sure I'm not missing anything. And then we'll Didn't you want to ask there. about the, the dev fee proposal that was? Uh, dev fee, I think we have fully covered because dev mm. fee originally was going, was proposed as non-obligatory. And then as far as I understand it, that got redone into essentially being uh, optional, uh, a request for an optional that would be built into the miner, the pool and stratums potentially, right? Um, yes. with, a, with a scalable, and I've already covered that on the channel. So I, I don't think that there's um, 
need to really discuss it unless there's something you wanted to add to it. No, no, no. That's uh, it. Seems like you you got it covered. Good. Everybody's just trolling, like when moon. Um, I think <laughs> I think we'll be good as far as this is concerned. So, Shai, thanks for coming on and answering all the questions. Um, sure, it's been a pleasure. Do you want me maybe to say something about smart contracts? So, is that a thing? Is that a pot? Are smart contracts coming to Casper? Well, they will come eventually. Uh, I know some people are concerned that uh, maybe smart contracts uh, wouldn't work on Casper. There are some uh, theories going around that uh, uh, people making these uh, audacious claims that the, the architecture doesn't support it, it's impossible. And I just want to assure people that um, having smart contracts on Casper is something that we've thought about from day one. Since before the first line of code was written, since before the name Casper were chosen, we'd have, we've had uh, research projects about it where we um, studied the problem. Actually, I wasn't a part of this particular effort, but I can tell about it. Um, and like, when you implement smart contracts, the two two paths you can go. You can also do them together; they don't contradict each other. And one is to go native, and the other is to go off chain. And we are considering both options at this point. And I just want to say that uh, because Casper has such fast confirmation times, we could and we consider doing the smart contracts off chain and just use the main chain as a settlement layer. And since we have such low confirmation times, then it would still work faster than native smart contracts on other chains, which are very limited by the high confirmation times. So this is just something I want to, to put out there. That, um, the fact that Caspa is very fast and uh, non-sharded is not a disadvantage to smart contracts like uh, some people are trying to portray it. And it actually makes solutions which are now considered too slow very, very fast. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I hadn't even uh, paid attention to any of the smart contract uh, conversations surrounding CASPA. Um, when I look at CASPA, I'm looking at it uh, for its transactional um, capabilities, right? So I'm putting it on on that kind of that side of the fence, not really on the, the smart contract, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, EVM side of the fence or whatever. Mm -hmm. But interesting that that would be a possibility in the future for, for CASPA. And I'll definitely pay attention uh, to that and make sure we cover it when it, if it ever comes to fruition, but thanks for giving me an update on that for sure. Sure. So thanks. Uh, where can people find you on, uh, as far as like, if they want to uh, tweet at you, DM at well, you. Twitter is the best place. Um, if you could tag me and um, so people could find my profile, okay. uh, I'd appreciate it. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, pretty much active on the um, Telegram channel. I also try to maintain some presence on the Discord server, but I think Twitter, if one is, anyone wants to reach me, Twitter, Twitter is the sure bet. Um, I also, I try to respond to DMs. Um, so if people want to reach out for me, I think that's the, the easiest way. Perfect. I'll link those down in the description below. And uh, thank you very much for coming on and talking to the community about CASPA. Sure. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure.